God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. But what is a stereotype? Interestingly, we use it basically in one context now. It used to be used in a technical context for typing, for printing. It was a tin set up for, for printing. It was the print face. It was a stereotype that was used over and over for making multiple copies of the same thing. So that was the tin that was set up, and it was you know, kind of like uh, before that they used wood carving to stamp and print. But <clears throat> stereotype means that one after another comes out the same. So we use it in a relational context, a sociological context, where we think of a certain group of people and we think of them all the same way. My son-in-law is now a cop. And if I say, what food item comes to mind when you think of cops? <laughs> Donuts, right? And, uh, and he, he commented to me a couple weeks ago, Why is that associated with cops? Doesn't everybody love donuts? And yet there is a stereotype that has cops and donuts associated together. So much so that when the bakery in Clare was going out of business, the local policemen bought it. And now they have multiple locations, cops and donuts. Uh, And you can buy the t-shirt or the mug or or donuts there. Uh, There's something about it. Stereotypes. So I, this is the setup here for where we're going this morning. Before we get to the word, I want stereotypes. So you think of cops, you think of donuts. If I name a region of the country, you're going to think something stereotypical of that region. When Scott Kendall uh, lived here, Scott and Kathleen lived here, I would give him grief because he came from California, which I continually referred to him, referred to to California in his presence for his benefit as the left coast. And uh, he took it good-naturedly um, until we played touch football and he tackled me. Uh, but <coughs> <laughs> that was a very decisive touch there, I tell you. Uh, but we think of stereotypes. We think of if I were to name a, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be kind here, so I'll just keep moving. Um, <laughs> things come to mind. If you name a nationality, things come to mind. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what year it was that the, the joke was the tallest basketball player in the NBA was a Chinese guy. The best golfer in the pro league was a black guy. Uh, The top rapper in the music industry was a white guy. And Germany didn't want to go to war that year. I mean, that was the running gag for the year of all these unstereotypical things. And so stereotypes. So before we get to the word, my question is, what stereotype do people put on you? How, how do they identify you and what stereotype do you fit into? See, when I think of, we went to West Virginia and I was, it was beautiful, and it, but the culture in West Virginia, there's a reason for stereotypes. There's There were some things there that came out, and I thought, hey, that's just like what I've heard about West Virginians. Um, And it was kind of fun. Um, And so I thought, well, what do they think of Michiganders? Turns out we talk fast. I didn't know that. Turns out we've got a funny accent. I didn't know that. I grew up in Minnesota. Turns out we tend to be emotionless. I knew that. (laughs) We have stereotypes. 
We have stereotypes. Let's lift our Bibles and make this declaration. This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It's true, and I believe it. This book is filled with hope and promise from my life, now and for eternity. I'm ready to receive what God has for me from His Word. In Jesus' name, amen. So stereotypes. There are stereotypes. We have them of other people. Whether we think of them or not, whether we're conscious of them, it tends to show up in our thinking. But people have stereotypes of us. Last week we talked about as followers of the word, as followers of Jesus, we ought to be people of the word. People ought to stereotype us as being Bible people. Now, Sometimes we get that, and it's, and it's often, stereotypes are often expressed in negative terms. So I want to be somebody of the book, the, of the Bible. Well, that means I'll get called a Bible thumper, all right? We express stereotypes oftentimes in negative terms. But I want to earn the stereotype that I've been given, and I want to be true to the word, and so we talked about the power of the word last week. Today I want us to look at another stereotype that ought to characterize us as followers of Jesus. And that is that we are people of prayer. We are people who pray. May it be that people who know you, because you are a follower of Jesus, when they, and maybe they're not comfortable with prayer, maybe they're not confident in prayer, but when they have a real need in their life, they call you because they know you pray. Because you're a follower of Jesus. That ought to be part of our stereotype. So if you've got the, uh, if you're following the outline and the bulletin, uh, it's there for you to take notes if you'd like. First of all, prayer is allowed. Prayer is allowed. We are never, we are never told like, like in some places, oh, no, you can't talk to the boss right now. You're only limited to talk to your immediate manager. No, you don't have access farther along. I love the story. So, number one, prayer is allowed. I love the story of a fellow who had a, uh, a business, a small local business, and, uh, and he was trying to get a hold of one of his suppliers. Because he wasn't happy with the way he was being treated because it was a small local business. It wasn't a large business. But he'd made some orders uh, with one of his suppliers and it didn't come through well or timely. And, and so he was not happy. And anybody he called, the sales rep that he called, gave him the runaround and the, you know, the relation department that he was trying to get a hold. They didn't answer his question. So he finds the name of the company president and he calls and asks to talk to him. And of course he gets through a couple of secretaries and finally to the secretary of the president, well, I'm sorry, but Mr. Anderson's in a meeting right now. Tell him this is Dave. He'll want to take this call. And as he's telling me the story, he, he winks and says, everybody knows a Dave. <laughs> Sure enough, the guy interrupted his meeting to say, Dave, what's up? And then he tells him which Dave it is. He says, I have been trying to get a hold of somebody who will service me. Your service department's not treating you well. Your sales rep is not representing you well. And he got a hold of the president of the company because he worked an angle. And everybody knows a Dave. And that got him in. Ooh, we don't have to work an angle to get a hold of God, to get God's attention. We are allowed to pray. We are allowed to approach God. When, uh, when my kids were little, uh, there were times when I expressly told them, you know, don't interrupt. You don't interrupt. You, 
If dad's having a conversation, don't interrupt. You know, wait your turn. Come over and hold my, grab my hand or you know, put your hand on my, my leg or something, but don't just start talking. I wanted to give them access, but I didn't want to give them disruptive free run. However, if there was an emergency, interrupt. By all means, shout it out. All right? There were times when, um, when my kids felt like just need to get a hold of dad. They knew they could. They knew they, now with cell phones. Oh my goodness! They can always send a text, and they know I'm going to check it within four or five days. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right, I'm not the sharpest with the phone, but I do check it, and I'll get back to them. Our God says that we can come to Him anytime. It is allowed. In fact, when Jesus saw the condition of the temple in Jerusalem and the things that were going on there, he goes back and quotes what Isaiah said. He was so disappointed that they changed it into a marketplace and they're buying and they're selling and they're cheating people because they've got an unfair exchange rate on the goods that they're selling and they're selling goods to be used in the temple. Oh, you travel the long distance and have your own goat to bring with you for sacrifice? Here, let us sell you one at our price. Kind of like buying hot dogs at the ballpark. You know, it's not a $6 hot dog. But they can charge that price in the ballpark because you're not leaving the stadium to get a hot dog. You're, you're there. That's what they were doing in the temple courts in Mark eleven seventeen. He said... Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. He was so disgusted with what they had done. He says, this is supposed to be a place of prayer. Where people can communicate with God. Where people can hear from God and be heard by God. This is supposed to be, that's the focus I wanted to have on this place. And he's quoting Isaiah. This was not a new idea. He was not establishing a a new thing with the temple. He says, wait a minute. You have lost sight of what's going on. Prayer was the stereotype that was supposed to be on the temple. Instead, in Jesus' time, the stereotype was, (laughs) bring your own sacrifice or you'll be charged an arm and a leg to buy theirs. It had changed. No, it was a place of prayer. Supposed to be. A place of prayer. Prayer is allowed, is allowed. But more than that, prayer is encouraged. Prayer is encouraged. In in Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes to the believers in Philippi, and in verse 6 he says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul says, by all means, if it's bothering you, If it's troubling you, if it's on your mind, pray about it. Bring it to God. Don't fret and fume and and worry about it. Bring it to the Lord. It's encouraged. Prayer is encouraged. And the writer to the Hebrew believers, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, says it this way. That's chapter 5. Get to the right chapter. There we go. Chapter 4. 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We don't have to wonder, boy, will God hear me? We don't have to wonder, am I, am I really good enough to have access to God? No, we are encouraged to come to the Lord. We are encouraged And we're told (laughs) we can have confidence, more than confidence, boldness. Some translations will say, with boldness, we approach the throne of grace. Because we've already got the invitation. We've already been given the open door of the access. One of the courses we sang this morning, take me past the outer courts. I want to go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus, when he died, 
the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple was torn. Access was given. Torn from top to bottom. There was a lot of symbolism there. God says, I want everyone to have access to me through my son Jesus. And so we do. Prayer is allowed, more than allowed. It is encouraged. We can come with boldness. We don't have to wonder, boy, am I going to get through or am I going to be put on hold? We don't have to worry, am I going to get in trouble for speaking out of turn here? No. We are encouraged to come to the Lord. And then thirdly, prayer is enabled. We are assisted in our praying Romans chapter 8, Paul says that the Holy Spirit has come to encourage us, to enable us, to strengthen us in our praying. Verses 26 and 27 of Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I'm so grateful that when I have prayed all I know to pray, when I am facing a wall of, oh, I don't know how else to pray about this, God says, I know exactly what you need. Let me help you here. And the Spirit of God in us prays with groans, we can't put it to words. In fact, we may speak words we don't understand at all as we pray in tongues. And the Spirit prays through us. And I really like that, that God allows us to be in the loop on that, so to speak. But my mind, I've exhausted what I know to pray. I, I can't pray any, any more. Or maybe I know so little about a situation, I'm not quite sure how to pray. So I call out to the Lord, and the Spirit, who knows how to pray, knows what is needed, prays through me. And I allow him room to pray through me. When God prays, he's going to get it right. Right? And so the Spirit of God, praying in us and through us, he's going to get it right. And we get to kind of tag along on that without our mind being really fully engaged because he's bypassed, he's overridden our limited thinking and gets to the core of the matter. And we may be praying in another tongue, another language. We may simply be uttering those moans that we can't put words to, but we're praying in the Spirit. And God enables us enables us. So, if you get to a point where you say, I just don't even know how to pray about that. Well, then pray in the Spirit. Because the Spirit enables us to pray. And I'll tell you, there are plenty of situations where, where people will specifically ask me to pray for this situation. And I'm thinking, I think I know what you want, but I'm not sure that that's what God wants. I'm not quite sure how to pray in this situation, but I know God does. So I'm going to pray in the Spirit. And I will pray for wisdom, and I'll pray for the grace of God to be poured out, and I'll pray the things I know to pray with my mind, and then I'll let the Spirit run with the rest of the prayer, because He's going to get it right. And I hate to admit this, but I suspect there are times when the Spirit has to undo some of the things I prayed. Because I know... James tells us there are times we pray amiss. I know I pray selfishly. I know there are times when I pray, and it's about me more than what God wants. I'm, I know I've been guilty of that. And so I admit it to the Lord, and I say, oh, but if this is not what you want, then lead me, guide me, and, and finish this prayer right I am greatly encouraged by the fact that there were times, there was at least one time we have a record of, where Jesus said, this is what I want. 
but whatever you want, Father. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is praying for some other way, he sees the cross ahead of him. He's been seeing the cross ahead of him for quite a while. But now it's imminent. And as a man, he is saying, if there's any other way, he is playing, praying for plan B. But he's willing to submit to plan A. Not my will, yours be done. I was listening to a, uh, a Christian speaker, uh, he's a comedian, uh, does a lot of entertaining, uh, but he's a believer, and he talks about becoming a believer and reading the Bible and finding just incredible stuff coming at him as he's reading Matthew and, you know, Jesus' life. And he gets arrested and crucified. And he's, you know, he's, he's stunned by it because growing up in America, he didn't hear this gospel story. He didn't really understand Jesus died on our cross to save sinners, rose again from the dead. He didn't understand some of the basic stuff of the... He was unaware of some of the basic stuff of the gospel. So then he's reading Mark, and he, and he reads the story again, and they come and arrest him, and he's reading Luke. He goes, I'm reading it for the first time. I don't know much about the Bible. And I'm thinking, they're going to do it again. He's praying in the garden. I'm saying, yeah, go, I know what's coming. Go, leave the back of the garden. They're going to get you again. Not realizing, all right, it's different writers telling the same story from different perspectives. There are times when we pray merely selfishly. Now, I think almost all prayer has a measure of selfishness. Our own Regards kind of rank high in our life. But it's more than me, 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 me for the glory of the Lord. There are things that God wants to do in our lives that bless us and give him glory. So it's a win-win thing, right? We come out ahead and God comes out ahead. And we see examples of this. Let me... Let me uh, run you through a few quick examples. Three people in, in Scripture that I want us to look quickly at. David. David wrote most of the Psalms. That was the prayer book of the Old Testament. He wrote most of the Psalms, and there are lots of examples. I'm just going to pull out one in Psalm 79, where he prays for himself, but also for God's glory. 79.9. Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. That God's blessing, God's grace would be ours to enjoy, but when God's grace moves in our life, God will get the glory for it. So we benefit, God's glorified, both are at work. You have heard me pray along those lines a lot. Somebody taught me that years ago, and I have adopted it as a pattern of prayer. Lord, for our benefit and for your glory. God gives us grace to bless our lives, that's our benefit, and to glorify himself, that he would get the credit for what goes on in our life, for the goodness that is going on in our life. He gets the credit, the glory. David prayed that way. And there are lots of others who prayed that way, but on and on, over and over, throughout the Psalms, we see that theme displayed. That phrase, those kind of uh, phrasings repeated. For our benefit and for your glory, the glory of your name. It's often the way David prayed, and others. Paul is another example of, of uh, a praying man Often in Paul's letters, because Paul wrote so much of the New Testament, we have several examples of his prayers. How he's praying for people. And so in Colossians, he specifically says, <clears throat> Since the day 
we heard about you. We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit, and the understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of the Lord, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience. He's praying for them. He's telling them how he's praying for them. And he's praying for their benefit and God's glory that God would be known by them and God's power and strength and wisdom and comfort would be experienced by them. He was praying for believers. Praying for believers. But then, of course, we have to look at Jesus. Jesus prayed, and there are a number of examples of of Jesus' prayers uh, in the scriptures. One in particular I want to highlight, and that's in uh, Luke chapter 6. And Jesus prayed for guidance. Jesus prayed, uh, Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. Before he chose and named his closest associates, disciples, those who would be apostles, those who would carry the the weight of leadership for the new church, he spent the night in prayer. He spent the night talking with God the Father to get the list right. I suspect, and because we know that there were a lot of disciples, and these were the twelve who were chosen to become apostles, We know that there were many of them because, well, in Acts, after Judas is gone, um, they, they decide to choose a replacement for Judas, and there's a couple of requirements. One of the requirements was, we must be somebody who's been with us from the start. So there was a larger band, and of course in other places in Scripture, Luke uh, chapter 10, I think it is, where Jesus sends out the 72. Oh, well, it's not just 12, there's 60 more of them. And he sends them out two by two. All right, so we know that it's a larger, and he chooses 12. Well, he spent the night in prayer, seeking guidance. Maybe it was during the night that he, that he really understood from the Father, you need to get a smaller group who will be closer to you, that you can really train and lead. I want you to get a smaller group within the larger group. You'll still have a larger group, but these will be apostles. Oh, okay. I don't know. We're not privy to how that whole discussion went through the night. And maybe he didn't know how many when the night began. Twelve. You need twelve. Twelve? I thought seven was a good number, right? I don't know how that discussion went. I suspect there was a belabored time in prayer when it came to Judas' name. Eh, that guy's kind of shady. I'm not so... Judas. Are we talking about the Judas from Nazareth? The Judas from... There probably were a few in the group. We know there was more than one. And I suspect, just speculation on my, my part, but that was kind of a lengthy part of the prayer. But my real point here is, if... Jesus needed to spend the night in prayer. How much more do we need to spend time in prayer when it comes to making decisions, when it comes to choosing the next step in whatever the journey has for us? We we have the example of Jesus. Not just saying, I am my father's son, so I'm just going to do it this way. He spends the night in prayer. David prayed often for God's glory and for his benefit. We see Paul praying often for believers, and he's telling them how he's praying for them. And those are great. Read through Paul's letters and find examples of where he's praying for people. You want to learn how to pray for people? 
Those are great ways to pray for people. Prayer is allowed. More than that, it's encouraged. And we are enabled. We are strengthened. We are given unique abilities to pray by the Spirit living in us. How well do we fit the stereotype of being praying people? We are followers of Jesus. We make that proclamation. Does the world look at us and see us as people of prayer? Do they trust us to pray? I should hope so. Let us live up to the stereotype. Let it be when somebody comes to us and says, hey, can you pray about that? Instead of saying, well, I'm not really good at that, but I'll, I'll pass that along to somebody who is. No. You pray about it. They come to you. You pray about it with them. And Gary, I love what you told me some time ago. Somebody grabbed you in the store and said, I want you to remember me in prayer. And they said what their need was. And I remember you saying, I don't remember anything. Let's pray right now. <laughs> That's a great response. Let's just pray right now. And, and I love it, because when you do that, you just grab them by the hand and, and start praying before they get away. And you teach them that they can pray. It's just conversation with the Father. Reaching out to God. Let us be people of prayer. Let us be people of the book. Let us be people of prayer. Let us establish patterns that are scriptural patterns that will develop the stereotype that the world sees in us. There's a reason for stereotypes. Stereotypes are often expressed in negative terms. May it be hard for the world to find negative ways to describe us. Because we are people of prayer. Not people who are so high and mighty that we don't think anybody else can pray. But we are people who are comfortable and confident and we know the language of prayer. Not that you have to pray in King James, but we know how to have a conversation with our Father because He is our Father. It's easy to talk to family, and we're family. Let us be people of prayer because the world needs us to pray. The kingdom needs us to pray. And when we pray, God is honored and his kingdom is strengthened. And I like what Bob Kilpatrick put in the song. I want to be known in the halls of heaven and feared in the corridors of hell. I'm not so sure that Satan and the demons can read our thoughts. But I'm not so sure that our silent prayers are not reverberating through the spirit world, holy and unholy. May we be known in the halls of heaven and feared in the corridors of hell because we're people of the word and we're people of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us access to your throne that we can come anytime in the name of Jesus and call out to you for the needs in our own life, the needs around us, the things that you care about, we can bring to you, the things that we care about, you feel and know, we can bring to you. And when we run out of words, you help us. You help us to pray right. We need your help. We need your grace. And we want your glory to be known not only in our lives, but through our lives and from our lives all around us that they would see your glory, not simply ours. And may the stereotype that the world has of us accurate as we reflect your glory into the world. Help us to pray. And in this room, 
while we're in an attitude of prayer. As I look around, I suspect that all of us have made a commitment to Christ. The f- people I see here today are, are people who I think have all made a commitment to Christ. But maybe you've been faking it. You've been playing the game, but the Holy Spirit has convicted you, has convinced you that you need to take a step of faith and say yes to Jesus in a way that you've never done before. And if that's you, then simply and silently, right where you're sitting, pray something like this. Father God, I I don't want to just be religious. I want to be in the family. I want to know you as my Father. I want to receive your grace on a daily basis as we live this life together. Holy Spirit, I need you to reside in me. And like we sang earlier, I want more of you. More of your love, more of your power in my life. If that's you, and you're making a decision for Christ right now, then I want you to raise your hand and look my way so that I can be praying for you this week. Something new. But I suspect most of us, all of us perhaps, have gotten there. But we want to renew the commitment you said yes to Jesus before, but you're saying, Lord, again today, I renew my commitment to you. This day, Lord, I'm going to trust you more. I'm going to receive your grace. I am open to all of what you have for me. Amen. Any of those of you who raise your hands, put your hands down. Amen. Father, you know our hearts. You know the journey we've been on and where we are right now. We want to take the next step with you. We want to take it with the full assurance of your guidance, your presence, your power at work in us. So we say yes to you. We have not only lifted our hands to you, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We lift our future to you. And we say, God, lead and guide us. Empower us so that we might benefit, yes, but more than that, so you might be glorified. So the world around us will see that you are God and you are good. And Lord, forgive us for being lax in our communication with you. For thinking somebody else will cover this prayer subject and I'm not really responsible for that. Forgive us, Lord, for, for missing the opportunity to spend time with you in prayer where we get to know you better and we get to trust you more. And help us, Lord, to be people of prayer, people who are in constant communication with you. So much so that the world takes note and says, pray for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Romans 15, 13. When I pause, you fill in the missing words. May the God of fill you with all and as you I don't usually pause there. Trust in him, yes. Trust in him so that you may with hope by the power of I don't usually pause there either so you're off balance by the power of the Holy Spirit we don't gin up this power in of ourselves it is God in us who gives us the power to will and to do according to his good pleasure so overflow because God is in you and pouring out of your lives Have a great day. God bless.